It's often exciting to look to the future of UNO, what it might be like in times to come. Sometimes, though, it's important to stop. Stop and take a good look at the past of the university, the people and the happenings that help make the excitement of future history possible. With this in mind, join me for Reflections in Time. This is what we call Reflections in Time. Over a period of a number of years now, I've been working with a great number of very interesting people who've been at our university for what amounts to altogether, I guess, hundreds of years. The University of Omaha and then the University of Nebraska to Omaha. And we title all these tapes Reflections in Time. And what we've asked our friends, colleagues, retirees from our university, or those who are about to retire, to reflect on their life and times personally and also in their relationships with the people and the plant here at the University of Omaha and now more recently the University of Nebraska at Omaha. And my guest as we record these thoughts in the spring of 1984 is Cheryl Pruitt. Cheryl was with the university longer than a goodly number of our colleagues past, present, or I'm quite sure future. I think the total years ran in the neighborhood of 40. We'll clear that up in a little while. First of all, Cheryl, I'm so glad that you could come up from your home now down in Oklahoma and visit with us. Oh, well, thank you. First of all, I got an idea, Cheryl, that you come from down south a ways. Uh, you spent a lot of your years of your life, you and your good wife and your family, up here in the Omaha area. But uh, where did things start out for you? Where, uh, before you got into engineering and related, related matters, uh, where, where's your home and wh where are your people from? That's, that sort of thing. I grew up in at Burlington, Oklahoma, which is about 40 miles northwest of Enid. Ah. Uh, 160 miles northwest of Oklahoma City. That was home for you and a lot of your relatives? That's right. That's Were you a farm boy? Yes, I was. Well, how did a farm boy ever come to town? What, uh, what caused you? Going to college and things like that? Where did you go to school? After I graduated from Burlington High School, I went to Oklahoma State. Right close by, really? Uh, it's about 130 miles. Yeah. yeah. And uh, is that where you started to have an interest in teaching, or did that come later? Uh, what about those early years? Oh, I was interested in, in engineering at Oklahoma State, and I was also mm -hmm. a little interested in teaching. And you recall in about 1933, it was hard times. Oh, yes, indeed. And we had to go in the direction we could find employment. And it seemed that teaching was uh, one of those that there's a possibility for And you teaching. came out of college in the depths of the of the Depression then, huh? 1933, that's right. Wow, well, what what kind of a job were you able to find? How long did you have to try and that sort of thing? Well, it took a little while to find I a job. I bet it did. But I landed a job uh, near Ardmore, Oklahoma. Oh, we're still staying in Oklahoma. And uh, I worked there for two years. Uh-huh, what sort of a job? I was uh, teaching math and I taught some industrial arts. Oh, you started right out teaching mm -hmm. then. What was your major from, from the university? What was your, what had you majored in? Is type of engineering or? Uh, type of engineering. And also at that time, the industrial education program was, was with, with the engineering department, mm -hmm. engineering college. So I took engineering subjects as well as a, a major in industrial education, industrial uh -huh. arts. Well, industrial arts over the years, in a lot of the smaller communities, I think especially, including some of the bigger ones, was a very popular form of education, wasn't it, for lots of people? It was a, a job that was fairly easy to obtain. Mm -hmm. And then I had a major in science. Um, uh, now, you're getting a job back there in the 30s, uh, Cheryl. It reminds me of the salaries that people were paid at that time. It was just ridiculous. Do you remember what they paid you to teach as you began back there in the Depression? And my first uh, job was a salary of $100 a month. Hundred dollars a month, nine months, nine hundred dollars. Uh, and this was in an oil field community where the salaries were better than normal. So and that was a, was that considered a pretty good salary a good then? Salary. Yeah, and there were lots of teachers who were making under a hundred a month. That's right. Well, so you started out pretty pretty good shape down in the oil fields. Well, I felt that I was lucky yeah, to get the job. Yeah. Well, where did life take you then after you'd been there a couple of years? Then I went to uh, as principal to a school. A uh, little ways from Tulsa. Oh, you moved up into administration. Uh, and 
the salary was quite a little better. Oh. In fact, I went up there at $145 a month. Well, that's a sizable, as we <laughs> say, percentage <laughs> increase, wasn't it? That's right. So, now you're into high school administration. How long did you did you stay with that? I was there about four years. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I got a call from Dr. Helmstead in the fall of 1940. And he was here at the university he at was that here time? At the university. He was here forever, wasn't he? He'd been <laughs> here. He was here a long time, yeah. It seemed that he had called Oklahoma State. I was wondering how he found out about you. And at that time, the Alumni Association and the emplacement office was the same, same place. Oh, well, that was helpful. See, there were about 3,500 students at Oklahoma A&M at that time. Is that right? Now it's like 20,000, I suppose, or something. And so the officer picked out my name as a possible candidate up here. And that was your first, uh, you probably had never heard of Omaha University that's, to land, huh? That's right. Well, what was your reaction when he talked to you on the phone? Well, I didn't know what to do. I was kind of, I was a long ways off. Yes. And I, had, I was satisfied where I was. But the more we thought about it, the more we decided we'd come up and see what Omaha looked like. And so you did. So when you say we, does that mean by that time you were a married man? I was a married man. Uh, and your good wife, did she come from Oklahoma too? She came from near where I grew up. Uh huh. So you'd known each other since no, you were. No, we, we met each other in, at Oklahoma and Oh, did you? So you decided to come up and look. And we spent a weekend up here. Now, I know this is kind of hard, but can you think back? Everyone often remembers a little bit of first impressions. As you came into Omaha back there in the 40s and came out here at the university, what were your first impressions of the place? Do you recall something about it? I think the beautiful trees on uh, uh, Happy Hollow Boulevard compressed this morning. And a lot of them, unfortunately, are still there. It's a beautiful drive. Yeah. And yeah. we're impressed with the Omaha as a, as a city. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And what, we, what about the university? How did it strike you? It wasn't very big then, certainly. Well, he said it was, as I remember, the only air-conditioned university in the United States or the world or something. Yes. And it was a single building, you know. And I thought, well, that's kind of something, wasn't it? Well, I guess so. Yeah, the main building, as we know, now Arts and Science Hall in 1984, that was the building, wasn't it? It was brand new, in fact, it wasn't it? Brand new, yes. Yeah. About a year old, I think, when I came to the new So you spent a few days here, got to know some of the faculty and staff, and decided to come? And we decided, then, after going back and taking things over, I decided we'd cast our lot here. Well, that's quite a change, going from way down there to way up here and moving out of administration and into uh, into teaching again and the college level. Yeah. It's a real change. Now, uh, what sort of things did you come here to teach? What were you first hired to do? I was hired to teach in the engineering department and to teach in the math department. Mm -hmm. So I worked with Dr. Earl for a while. Oh, I so you were both sides of the fence, you might say. Math and certainly engineering had a lot of math, but you were doing both, really. That's right. And what kinds, uh, do you recall at that time, in about 1940, 41, right? Right. Uh, what kind of engineering majors did we have? What kind of engineering courses did we teach? Who were we t trying to train then? At that time, we had a two-year program. I see. In engineering. We mm -hmm. trained the students to go to the Nebraska or to Iowa State. And we taught uh, various courses in mechanical drawing, and we had our basic engineering courses, statics and strength materials. And, and uh, at that time, you know, it was war year time, so yes. we didn't expand it very much. And you had a small student population, too. It was pretty small, wasn't it? Then you remember about how big it was? There were 900 people at the university when I came out here. And a good number of them, I imagine, were women. During the war, early part of the war years, right? Yes, yes they uh, were. Yeah. I remember well the time that war was declared. Mm -hmm. uh, we called a convocation and in the auditorium of the administration building, where it used to be. Yeah. We had it was a combination a gym and uh, chairs for uh, various functions we had at the university. Plays, graduation, mm -hmm. gym, it was everything, wasn't it, for big groups? And so. They had, I guess, a radio set up, and we all listened to President Roosevelt declare war. Isn't it interesting we can remember the day and the time when we found out about Pearl Harbor, can't we? That's right. And you were here, and you were teaching, and that, of course, I imagine, 
the war coming then started to make a difference, had an impact on the university, didn't it? Very much so, because we started doing war training courses. Well, what sorts of things did you have there? We uh, had inspection courses for off at Air Base for the inspectors that worked uh, on, uh, in fact, work there. Was there a base there then, or was that just the bo bomber, Martin Bomber plant, or was that that it was an Air Force base right then too? I think it was. And of course, Martin Bomber plant came there, mm -hmm. that, uh, and mm -hmm. we started training for the Martin Bomber people. Yeah. And well, we had programs specifically for them. We did inspection courses. Ah. Yeah, I taught in that service as the department taught. So actually, we started to get a student body that we hadn't had before. That's right. But did the enrollment? You said 900 when you came. Did it hold up? Did it get smaller? What was it like? Well, it, it got smaller in terms of college students, but it was more than filled with war training classes. See, Dr. Helmstetter did a lot of work in promoting that, and there was Mr. Kurtz, who was a department head when I came. There was Bill Duran that uh, worked in, uh, particularly in the air pilot courses. Oh, so you had a whole sphere of activity that related quite definitely to the to the war. And very much so. Now, um, how long did this go on? During most of the war years then? Yes, right through the war years. Mm -hmm. In fact, many of us were didn't didn't join the service because we were training here, and they, we'd get uh, deferments. They didn't want us to leave, and because we were doing active war training, we had the civilian pilot training, and all of us worked in. I taught air navigation and civil air regulations, and a lot of things. Is that right? Now, did that make a difference to other parts of the university, though, that weren't so war related? Were the enrollment small, and did a lot of the people have to go off to service, that type of thing? That's right. Yeah. Now, during those years, when you came here, who was president of the University of Omaha? And Dr. Haynes. All right. And he was president until? Dr. Bell came here. Which is, was the late 40s, right? So you were here for four or five years at least, weren't you, under Dr. Haynes? Yes. What do you remember about, uh, about him? At that time, his wife had passed away, uh -huh. and uh, I enjoyed very much visiting him. He'd come around and visit. He was very personable to visit with. I, he was sort of a cozy guy, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Yeah. Was he easygoing? He wasn't very domineering, was he, that type of thing? I, I didn't feel he was that way. I, I enjoyed working with him. But you're, you came, you were hired by, and you really worked for all through those years for Richard, for Dr. Helmsetter then, didn't you? Yes. Sir. Now. Wasn't he involved with the business as well as with engineering for a while? Uh, yes. Before he really got the engineering college going? He taught both places. Yeah. He, was, yeah. he was responsible for the uh, applied arts, but it wasn't the applied arts at that time. No. You know, when I first came, I was in the Arts and Science College, and Dr. Dean Hope uh, employed me. That's right. There really was only one college, wasn't there? And the faculty members, we could get them all in one room. <laughs> Yeah, do you remember the size of the faculty? Well, you mentioned 900 students. How many people were teaching here full-time, let's say? It seemed like there was between 36 and 40. Well, you're a good big table. You can get all around <laughs> it, couldn't you? So calling faculty means they could really t tell who was absent. Well, that was one that impressed me, the first faculty meeting I attended. Uh -huh. uh, to see what took place in the college faculty, what they would do. Now, this is really pulling back into memory, but... What do you remember about those very early years? Uh, you mentioned we've talked very briefly about Haynes. Uh, who were some of the other people from the faculty meeting and other things that, that come jumping out at you when you think back to those 40s? Well, there was Dr. Crane. Oh, yes, I remember him, too. And there was uh, Mr. Stye was in speech. Mm-hmm. And, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Bill Thompson was yes. there. What was Thompson doing when you came here? Well, he was teaching psychology in the uh, arts and science colleges. But he was not a dean or anything mm -hmm. like that. He was another professor just like you. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Now, I think one of the next things we want to talk about is the campus, because it has changed a lot in the 40-some years, hasn't it? Yes, it has. But uh, we're just about the end of our first run of tape, and so we'll identify it and tell our friends that we're going to be back for tape number two in just a moment. Where you're looking at what we call the first segment of the Cheryl Pruitt tape of Reflections in Time, recorded in the spring of 1984. This is tape number two in the Cheryl Pruitt Reflections in Time, here recorded in the spring of the year 1984. 
Carroll at the time we record this program is uh, up visiting on the campus for just a day or two. He and a number of other people who have been a part of our university for a long, long time are being honored by the Alumni Association and friends in a scholarship way that relates to students as they come and go and in a way that will help people like Cheryl be long remembered for their attachment to the university. We were talking about attachments to the university, Cheryl, as we finished that first tape, and we were talking about really part of the important part of the university, and that's people. And we'd mentioned Dr. Haynes and Dean Thompson and, of course, Dean Helmstetter, who brought you here in the early 1940s. Who are some of the other names that kind of creep out of memory when you think of the first years that you and your wife spent here in Omaha? Well, I think that, uh, Mr. Kurtz, who was head of the department at that time, was a, a very personal person. He helped us to get acquainted with Omaha in a very remarkable way. Oh, did he? He sort of acquainted with you with the city. He sort of took us over as uh, young people uh -huh. uh, that needed some chaperoning in a big city. And, of course, to you, it probably was a fairly big city. It was. Well, it was quite different, though, than now, isn't it? It, it surely was. It, it was a lot smaller. It yeah, yeah. Uh, the cornfield down on 72nd Street when we came. Yes, west of 72nd was not in the city at all, was no, it? it in fact, the university that you came to work at hadn't been out here too long, and it was pretty well out in the country, wasn't it? It surely was. Yeah. Uh, well, you liked those first years. You enjoyed it. Did you? Were you happy that you'd made the change, Cheryl? from high school administrative work? Uh, during the first uh, few years with the war effort, we were teaching four nights a week, particularly in our college, it wasn't college, but Department of Engineering, and we were all very, very busy. And four nights a week for six months, you didn't have much else to reflect about. You, you didn't. just get your lessons and, yeah. and go to school. You didn't get a chance to get lonesome for Oklahoma. But one thing I know particularly, on the 11th of November, I got up and there's snow on the ground, and it's so slick I couldn't drive the car, so I had to walk about 15 blocks to school. And you know that snow stayed on until about April that right <laughs> year. And I suppose winter, as you learned to know it here, was quite different than you usually run into down in Oklahoma and North Texas and places like that, huh? I thought maybe I'd made a mistake after that <laughs> first snow case. Now you were describing. I think on the latter part of the earlier, the first tape that we did, Cheryl, about what you taught when you first came here. You were teaching with Jim Earl over in math, as well as working with Carl Helmstetter, the dean, over in what was quite a new school of engineering, right? And you described a sort of pre-engineering program that was finished at other schools, right? That's right. Well, do you remember, let's take the academic program for a few minutes, Cheryl. Remember how it developed and why it developed. Well, at the time, we had one uh, college when we came. And arts and science. Arts and science. Or called liberal arts, right? Liberal arts. Right. And we decided that if we were going to teach some applied arts, we needed another college with a different objective than the objective of the arts and science. And so that uh, brought about, uh, about the establishment of the College of Applied Arts When did that take place? When you came, in other words, it was the Department of Engineering. That was all, yes. And then it became a college. But when was that? In the 40s sometime or what? That must have been in the last part of the, of the 40s. Had Dr. Bale arrived by that time? Do you I, recall? I, yes, I believe he had. Mm -hmm. And so now you were starting to take engineering students on through a program but more completely. Uh, uh, yes, uh, with, the, with the help of Mr. Kurtz and, and Dr. Helmstetter, we established the business and engineering degree. Now, what kind of a degree program was that? Uh, flesh it out a little bit, if you will, Cheryl. Well, it's about the first two years of engineering, the normal course, the math and the drawing and, mm -hmm. and English and so on. Just a standard two-year program. And then we took the uh, accounting and business courses, induction of business, and got a major in business of about, I think, about 30 hours. And uh, the boys coming back from the war, it was a very popular program. Yeah, now this would outfit people really to handle a business as well as know, have some knowledge of engineering, right? That is true, and it, it was a good degree for about well, 15 or 20 years. Was it because of the times that that's what they needed? Is that how you struck on that? Because we don't have that kind of major specifically much anymore, do we? No, we don't. Well, uh, why was it so good right then, do you recall? Well, it enabled a student to fit into many situations. And 
industry and in business. And, of course, the technology wasn't developed as it is today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it filled a big need. Now, as it became a college and a part of the, uh, as this university became more of a university and less of just a college, uh, who were some of the people that started to come on board and join you and the faculty there that you remember? Uh, I know it's not always easy to remember names, but just do the best you can, Gerald. Jim Brown came. Oh, yes, I remember him well. And he was a mechanical engineering mm -hmm. major. And let's see, who were some of the others? Bill Duran took full time for a while. Mm -hmm. And Glenn Blackstone came along. Oh, that's there. a name I don't recall early years and taught particular war training courses and stayed on a little while after the war. I see, I see. And now, did the engineering college, as you began it in the late 40s, did it, uh, you mentioned this business engineering program mm -hmm. that was very popular in that period and because of the times you were in, what were some of the other things that were developed then as you went along? Because you were here through much of the history of this college up until almost today. Uh, the next degree, for, I guess really the first engineering degree we had was industrial engineering. I see. Okay. Now what would that outfit a young man or woman for? That was the era in which motion and time and factory planning and, and engineering economy evaluations of, of the business cost analysis factor. Mm -hmm. Quite a wide range of... Uh, coverage in, in that particular program. Real wide, yes. Mm -hmm. And this we came about the time we uh, got the new Applied Arts Building. Mm -hmm. Say, the new Applied Arts Building. I moved into that too, you know, into part of it, but that was pretty much your first real building, wasn't it? It was. Before that time, where were you teaching everything? Because it, it didn't always stay in what is now Arts and Science Hall or the main building, did it? No, we, our first move was to the Quonset Hut. <laughs> Uh, where we spent uh, 10 or 15 years in which we taught the various courses. But it seemed after the war was over that everybody thought that the men that were pilots would come back and want an airplane. Mm -hmm. So we sort of expanded and uh, had an A&E program for a while so the boys coming back could get their license and, and take care of their planes if they what, were going to fly. Was it popular, like you thought? It was for a little while, but it didn't uh -huh. last for a while. Is that right? I guess there wasn't enough money for everybody to have the planes that no. they wouldn't we would have. Well, of course, now as you uh, as we built the engineering building for the applied arts, that made for a lot of lab space that you just didn't have before, didn't it? That That's type that of thing. That's true. So we developed civil engineering uh, degree. Oh, was that when that started? After the new building, really? And uh, Jim Hossett came about that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, Harold Davis came on the scene and after World War II. Mm -hmm. Well, now, that's a variety of people that many of them are still in the area. Uh, and I shouldn't forget to mention Mr. Sebastian Williams. Oh, yes. Still living in 1984 and near campus and reasonably healthy. And he did an excellent job of spread car between the various colleges and in business. He, he was a master at uh, uh, working with business people in Omaha. Yes, he related heavily to the local business community, didn't he? Yes, he did. And in your area of concern, that was... Really quite important, wasn't it? It was very important. Now, th those are names that stand out. One, uh, let's leave the names for a while in the curriculum, and let's move over to the campus. We mentioned that when you first came to campus, why, uh, there was only the main building, really, and the field house, right? Well, there really and wasn't a field house. No, that hadn't quite no, been finished, it had it? All we had was the amphitheater for the... the uh, football games. Mm -hmm. And the first building, as I remember, was, was the library, Gene Epler Library. Now that came... You know, Cheryl, when we talk about the library, and the library that a lot of the people in the 50s and 60s and so on used to know, I want you to remember the old library in, uh, in the main building. That was something else, wasn't it? The east, northeast corner of the old er, administration building. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's where we had the library. I was on the library committee, and our big concern was if we build a new library, how would we get the students to go to the new library? They didn't want to go. <laughs> but they did. They uh, surely did. They yeah. were happy to get 
the building. The old library was full of books, but not much room to sit down, wasn't there? That's right. And that was really a marvelous change. And that took place during your time here, too. Of course, when you came here, eating, the library, convocations, everything was in the Arts and Science Hall, wasn't it? And the old cafeteria, cafeteria that was kind of interesting. I liked it, uh, too. A soup for seven cents, a bowl. <laughs> And we can get a pretty good meal at lunch for 25 cents. Yes, how times have changed. And we had a factory dining hall that everybody would come, and we had a, we had a enjoyable time in investing with each other. I remember that dining room right next to the student center, practically, and it was a marvelous place for fun and fellowship at noon, wasn't it? Well, it was. So when you remember the university during that period, the late 40s, early 50s, and I'm starting to remember it too now, that was really a place where we, you got to know a little bit about nearly everybody, didn't you, in the faculty and staff? That is true. Even as it had grown a bit after Dr. Bell came and in through the year, it was still quite small, wasn't it? Uh, yes, up in, until after the war years, it, it was fairly small. You remember that White House that we had? Were you here whenever we uh, had the White House where they did war training courses and, and we had our cafeteria there? No, that was a little before my time. Describe that and where specifically it was located, Cheryl. Uh, there was a building just a few feet south of administration. It was the southwest uh, corner of the southwest wing. Uh, they taught many courses during the war years, and so uh, many things happened. Uh, they, I think the art, had, art people mm -hmm. had their pottery. Right. Uh -huh. The one they used to call the shack after shack. a while. Right. Uh -huh. oh, it, it became, in effect, the student center. It did. That's now right. Now I know the building we're talking about. I'd forgotten about it. And that was here for a long, <laughs> long time. Yeah, but that and uh, the faculty club room and those things really formed a pattern of camaraderie that uh, is kind of hard to hang on to when you get two, three times that many students and staff, right? That's right. I suppose that could bring us to some other changes. The 50s was a, another general period into the early 60s. How did you start to notice, uh, even apart from the engineering college that you were a part of, Cheryl, uh, the university began to change a bit, didn't it? Growth was one thing. Yes, what are some of the changes that you recall that seemed to make quite a bit of difference? When we moved into the Applied Arts Building, which uh, was, I guess, later changed the engineering building. We had more room, we, ex we expanded, and the civil engineering curriculum took uh, place, so there was new courses to teach there. And in industrial engineering, well, there's new courses there that all of us taught. My mm -hmm. especially there was most in time in that curriculum. Now, during all these changes, the building and expansion into a college from a department, did you teach a great variety of things, or did your, did your pattern of course, work stay pretty much the same. You're mentioning all those courses during the war. You needed to tool up on a lot of stuff, didn't you, as you grew and changed? As the budget was not as large as we'd like to have, we all had to teach many courses. So we would bone up and teach what we had to teach. So I taught a, quite a variety of courses during those years. And that was a, in, mainly in the post-war period there when post things really grew? That's right. Then, did you notice things start to move into more of a specialty area a little later? As we got bigger, where you taught certain things and we hired other people for other certain well, that's things? That's true. We went into our specialty. Then, when did that about happen about in your memory? Uh, uh, in, sure. in the la late 60s, I guess. Or middle 60s, someplace uh, during the 60s. Mm -hmm. Now, with all those early years that you've mentioned, you came in the early 40s, were into the 50s and early 60s, uh, you had a department. You taught yourself, as you said, in math and in engineering. Did you notice any difference in the kinds of students that were coming to us for, for school work, for help? Uh, did they change or did they remain pretty much the same? Did you notice any changes in the student body in those early to mid-early years, in the, say about the halfway through your tenure here? Well, the early students, as I recommended, they were, I mean, I remember them, they were very enthusiastic and they were good students and that took place through most of the uh, years i'd say the last of the uh, last part of the 60s while we began to get a little different type of student mm -hmm. they weren't sure just what they uh, wanted they were staying here because of the draft they didn't want to go to draft so there's some unrest which was shown throughout the united states and we got our share of mm -hmm. that in this university. Cheryl, we're down to about our last three minutes or so on this tape 
and I think it would be a nice time you and I were visiting before we recorded about some of your reflections on what you and I, or people like us, in effect, owe the university. And I think you had some feelings and some remembrance about that, and I'd like to have you share that with our friends who in years to come will be looking at this videotape. A uh, university means a lot to a student that goes here and graduates. I can recall that as a result of the alumni organization at Oklahoma State, which was Oklahoma and at that time, uh, they recommended me for this job. And it was Dr. Helmstetter who called. But without that contact, I wouldn't have had any knowledge of the uh, University of Omaha winning a faculty member. Mm. And so we never outgrow our university. And we mean a lot to the university. I think we're there a while uh, through our helps, but the university means a lot to the student that graduates, the alumni. Uh, their life changes as a result of that experience. I guess one last question I might ask you to wind up our time on tape together here. You've spent so many years at it. What were the most satisfying things about your life as a teacher? I think it's the contact that one made with the various faculty and with the students, having them come in and visit with you and uh, talk to you of the times ahead and what they're doing and uh, general nice feeling you have working with students. It makes you younger to have them come in and visit with you. And I, and I felt that all of us had many uh, students who would come back and visit with us. Now I can understand how you've stayed so young all these years. It's <laughs> those student contact hours. Cheryl? <laughs> It was great to have you, and I appreciate your sharing time with us on this segment of what we call Reflections in Time. We recorded this as we put the dateline on it as we winded up in the spring of 1984, and our guest on this segment of Reflections in Time has been Cheryl Pruitt, long a member of our engineering department and our engineering college here at the University of Omaha, and then finally at the University of Nebraska at Omaha.